Hello everyone and welcome to the next session on Marketing 432. So today what I would like to do, of course, is go back to what we were discussing in the last class where we were talking about key account management and take you through the next stage of key account management for the first half of this recording. And then in the second half of the recording, I will actually address the questions that you raised or some of the top questions that were raised from your backpack assignment number eight. So let's begin with sharing my screen for, um, let me just take a look at it. I guess this is it, so apologies for that. All right, so now what we're doing is that we're talking about your key account management and essentially what we looked at in the last class. So what did we discuss in the last class? So if I were to go in here and say, okay, let's take a look at kind of let's jog your memory. So what did we discuss in last class? And essentially what we said was, if we can go in here, what we discussed in the last class was of course, relatively we said, well, we have the go to market strategy and the go to market strategy is designed by your different kinds of sales processes, right? We talked about the different kinds of sales processes, and essentially, if you go if you go back, we talked about the transactional customers, the the uh, functional customers, the consultative customers, and the enterprise customers. And what we said was, as much as possible for the transformational, sorry, for the uh, transactional and the functional customers, our job is to try and reduce the cost of sale. Right, we have to reduce the cost of sale, and we do this by either working with third parties, that is your channels, or you could set up your e-commerce platform, right? Later on in this semester, we'll talk a little bit more about e-commerce, right? And then of course, for the customers about here, you want to take care of them yourself. So essentially I'm gonna go direct with my own sales organization that will be taken care of. And in the, that in the direct sales organization, which I did not mention last time, is you're going to have your field sales force. That is the sales organization that will be visiting customers face to face. Of course, during COVID, things have changed. And then you also have the inside sales force. And essentially, in next week, we will have some guest speakers where they'll be talking about the field sales force. But we might also have speakers later on in the semester who might actually come and talk about how to manage the inside sales force as well. But the key accounts that we're talking about to a large extent are serviced by your field salespeople. And typically they happen to be with these two kinds of customers, either your enterprise or your consultative customers, right? Now, if you want to try and take a look at it, if you want to try and take a look at key accounts, how do we try to identify key accounts? So that is the next thing that we actually were discussing. And if you say, if you want to identify key accounts, there were four sets of criteria. And these criteria could be exam questions. The four criteria and how you put them to use. The four criteria, the one is what we say is quantitative outcome criteria. That's quantitative. The second one is the customer needs. Then we talked about the third one which had to do with the strategic fit with the organization. And the fourth one was, what are the supplier strengths? Essentially what you have to do, and when you do the exam, I will particularly pay attention to what you say is that these three, the first three are all about trying to gauge how important is the customer to us to us as a supplier, the customer to us. The last one is where we start asking ourselves the question, how important are we to the customer? So essentially just because we think the customer is important, the question is, is that feeling reciprocated by the customer, right? And essentially then I showed you the tool where we try to identify all these criteria and go through the evaluation criteria that's got to do with what is the evaluation criteria. So 
So we give the examples. Let's say, for example, I'm just going to show you some. Let's say revenues. Let's say margin. Let's say product quality. Willing to pay for value. For value, let's say these would be some of the criteria that you choose from here. The next thing is we have to say what is their importance. And the idea is that all of them should add up to 100. So let's say this is 40, this is 20, this is 25. So this would automatically become 15 because it has to add to 100. And then what do you do? You start evaluating. So let's take a look at customer A. Okay, let's see how much we give the customer. So on a scale of zero to 10. So the customer, okay, revenues is gonna be, let's say eight, uh, five, five, nine. This is what the evaluation of that particular customer is based on these criteria. Then you could say, what is the total score for customer A? And that is given by 40 multiplied by eight, that is 320. That is 100, this is 125, this is 135, so that is 260, 360, uh, 680. Similarly, you will do the same thing for customer B. Let's say the customer B ends up with a score of 580, then you know that 680 is going to be a higher score, so this is going to be more of a key account than this. Right? Again, this is where we left off. Now, once we identify the key accounts, how do we go about selling to them again? And this is where we go into the idea of strategic key account selling. And what are the different steps in strategic key account selling? The first one that you have to, of course, is you need to identify your key accounts, right? So essentially that is what we discussed. If I go in here, when we do this, this is your identification of the key accounts. So the first thing you have to do is, who are my key accounts? Because your key accounts have to be treated differently than your normal accounts, right? Now, the next thing you have to do, once I identify the key account, then within every key account, I have to go identify what are the needs and the pain points. So it's just not needs. What are the pain points for the customer, right? And this pain point is not restricted to an individual of the customer. It's for all the members of the decision-making unit. Again, a decision-making unit are all the people in the customer's organization who will be involved in making a decision whether to work with you, yes or no. Once I identify the needs, I've been saying this from the beginning, once I identify the needs, then I link the needs to what I can sell to my customer. What kind of products can I sell? How much services am I going to sell to them on top of it? And essentially those will become your solutions. What kind of solutions will I help make the life easy for my customer and solve their pain points? Once I do this, then of course, as we have discussed earlier, I have to go back and again, explain what is the right value proposition for the customer. But this time the value proposition is customized per customer. Earlier, when you did the study, when you were talking about the definer driver, where we're talking about value propositions, we were talking about value propositions at the level of a customer segment, right? That's a group of customers. Right now, when you go and talk to a customer, depending upon what is the need of that specific customer, you have to customize your offering and say where you're different from the competition. And once I do this, then I have to start taking into account what are all the different costs for my customers and how can I take care of the transaction cost? And I'll explain to you what a transaction cost when I show you an example. But then of course, once I do this, the main aspect of key account is once I close the deal, then how do I service my customer more and take care of the customer after the sale? So in a B2C context, what does after sale mean? Typically think about your car, when you buy a new car, and then after that, after every six months or after every 2,500 miles, you go in for a checkup or a, something like that, that's called the aftercare service, right? 
So now if you try and take a look at it, so let's say for example, you have identified your key accounts. The next thing we have to do is identify the customer's needs. And here, of course, typically who are the members of the members of the customer's decision-making unit? Essentially, this is an example from a company that I've had a chance to work with in the past. So these are essentially the plant CEO could be the decision maker. This could be the buyer. This could be the influencer, right? The buyer could also be the gatekeeper. The plant production could be the supervisor. And this could be the actual user, the person who uses your particular product. So essentially in this scenario, we are looking at one, this is a dual role, a buyer who also makes the decision, but also get gatekeeper. So essentially you have one, two, three, four, five, six. You have six roles here. Of course, in some companies, you could also add somebody from finance, so that would be role number seven. So you can take a look at it, but what you need to understand is that this individual is gonna have a set of needs that are going to be different. So they are not going to be the same all the time. Yes, there are some needs that could be similar, but there could be very unique needs for the CEO that might not necessarily match with the needs of the buyer, might not necessarily match with the needs of the R&D, might R&D stands for research and development, might not necessarily match. But of course, there could be some levels and that's what you'll see in the following page. And I just wanted to give you an example. Just you, you try and take a look at it. Essentially what you see, this is from a real example from a company that I actually worked with in the past. So you will see that these are the needs. You'll see that the needs of, again, a decision maker, is quite different from the needs of a buyer, is quite different from the needs of an influencer. If you know to see everything that they say, they are looking at different aspects. And that is what makes it very challenging for a key account manager is you don't do it with all of your customers. You choose the customers carefully. And essentially what I'll have to do is once I choose who's my key account, then the next thing I have to do is go member my member in the customer's decision-making unit and then try to identify their needs. This is what your job is. Now, why do I need to identify the needs? Because once I identify the needs, then I can link it to what I can sell to that particular customer. And that is what it is. So essentially, we go back to what we were discussing a long time ago, we said, the solution that we provide is again, remember value is benefits over price. That's what we said, right? So which means that at the end of the day is our job is to try to take the customer's focus on the benefits. And that benefits could be because of what a fantastic product that I have or what great service that I provide or what a very strong brand that I provide. Now, again, the purpose why we talk about brand, brand is a big risk reducer for the customer. So if, the, if you have a good reputation in the market, the customer is going to look at you as less of a risk for them to work with. So that is why it is extremely important for you to leverage your brand when you're talking to your customers, right? So now what I need to do is I always, when we talk about this, I need to understand my product, my service and my brand. But again, the key is in order for me to deliver this value, I need to know what are the benefits. But in the previous slide, we try to identify the needs of the customers. So now if I wanna create value, I have identified the needs of the customer then I link it to my offering. What is it that I have to sell to my customers? And that will create the value. And that value, again, as I said, the offering is connected to my product, my service, and my brand. So essentially, when I know what the customer wants, then I can go and say, hey, dear customer, this is what you're going to get.
right? And again, you will see that there's a lot of customization that will need to happen. And to a large extent, when you work in many organizations, the customization does not happen to be with the product. It has a lot to do with the service that you provide. Customization usually is what we refer to as a value added service, right? Now, of course, if I do all this, now the question is, can I go and talk about the value proposition? And here is what I want you to remember when we had discussed the concept of the value proposition, you had this in your exam, right? It could be that when I ask you this question about strategic selling, I might ask you the question about what is the difference between a value proposition versus a USP. A USP stands for unique selling proposition. Value proposition is a marketing tool. So value prop is a marketing tool. Whereas a unique selling proposition is a sales tool, a, a value proposition. And I'm not gonna explain this because you should know this by now because you've already read the article on value proposition. A, mar a, a value proposition is typically a marketing tool that is done at every specific customer segment. So it's not an individual customer, but it's actually a group of customers. A value proposition typically goes into your brochures. It goes into your marketing campaigns. It goes into your website. And the purpose of the value proposition is to trigger the interest in a particular customer. But once the customer shows an interest, then you see that the value proposition is further customized. So a value proposition is more general to a, cust to a specific customer segment, whereas a USP is customized for every individual customer. But in order for this to happen, if you need to go in, it's not the marketing people who are responsible for developing the USP. You will see it is actually the key account managers who are responsible for that. So again, a USP is a unique selling proposition, which is specifically customized based on identifying the needs of every individual customer. Now, when you do it at the level of this segment or a group of customers, that is a value proposition. And this is definitely going to be an exam question. And while in the exam, I might not expect you to do this, but this is an example of a company that I worked with, which tried to develop a unique selling proposition, USP to a particular customer. You will see, as I mentioned earlier, we said the value is gonna be your product, service, and brand. And when you talk about benefits, right? So if you go in here, what we have is you have the product benefits, the service benefits and the brand benefits. And then what the customer tells you is what is important to them. So the customer is looking for a reliable product that increases their productivity. They have a wide variety or range of products that are very user friendly. And if you notice, then you give an importance 30, 50, 10 and 10, which means that how important are each of these. And then this is the rating. So then you ask the question, Okay, our company, let's say your company is ABC. Then you say, how well do we perform on the reliability on a scale of one to five? So you'll see that here the customer is given a five. So which means that as far as the customer is concerned, you are a reliable supplier, right? Does this, again, the four here would mean that when it comes to downtime, what is downtime? Downtime is all the time that when a machine or a computer or anything breaks down and it does not get used, that is downtime. The amount of time it does not get used. That is a downtime, right? So when you have the downtime, so essentially what you see here is the rating is not as good as it here, right? So what do you do? You compare how the customer evaluates you versus how this is the competitor how they evaluate the competitor. And what you see here, and if you go back to the article on value proposition, we talk about here, 
we have, this is what we refer to as point of parity or point of equivalence where there is no difference in the mind of the customer between you and the competition. So if they give you a five, they've given a competition a five, which means that they don't see the difference in what you can provide as against what the competition can provide, right? But of course, if you go and take a look at the range, which is what here, the customer has given you a five and they've given a four to the competition. So of course, there's a slight advantage and this is what is referred to as the point of difference. This is what sets you apart from the competition. So this is how you try and understanding the needs of the customers and then you create the right kind of value proposition, right? And then of course, what we then do, if I do all of this, then the next thing for me to do is, what do I mean by transaction cost? So for, to help understand transaction cost, let us say that you are going, let me, let me try something new here. So I'm going to insert a new slide. I'm going to go in, let us say transaction. So to help you understand trans transaction costs, let us say you're going to go buy a car, right? So what's the first thing you do? There is a cost of acquiring the car. Then what do you do? You pay the taxes on the car. Then there's taxes, then you pay for the registration. Then what do you do? You pay for gas. Then you pay for insurance. Then over the lifetime, you spend a lot of money on maintenance and repair. Right? These are all, so this is, all, all this is one cost, this is cost one, this is cost for another transaction, this is another cost, another transaction, this is another cost, another transaction cost, this is cost five, and this is cost six. So essentially, when overall, when I buy a car till the point I get rid of it, my total transaction cost from the point where I buy it till the point where I dispose of it is going to be cost one plus cost two plus cost three all the way to cost five. Well, I might as well put it here. It's all the cost here. This is the total transaction cost. And then of course, when you add all of them, this is normally what you will hear the term total cost of ownership. So that is how much is it going to cost you to buy and use a particular product till you're able to dispose of the product. So essentially what you have to be careful about is you have to make sure that when a customer and you talk to a customer, you should be able to talk to the customer, not just about, hey, my product might be expensive to buy initially, but it is expensive to buy, but it is easy to maintain. It gives you a lot of gas mileage and it does a fantastic job. So that is why if you try and take a look at it, a Toyota usually happens to be a little bit more expensive than some of the other cars. Why? The cost of buying Toyota might be high, but maintenance, the gas mileage it gives you is actually makes up for all the things that you actually pay for in acquiring the car. And that's why you have to talk to your customers, especially with the key accounts, not about just the cost of buying, but also the cost of using the product completely over the life cycle of the product. And this is what is referred to as transaction costs. Or when you add all of this, this is the total cost of ownership that it takes for an owner of a car and it does not stop at just buying a car. It's all the things that you have to take into account. That is buying the car, paying for taxes, 
using the car, repairing the car and getting rid of it. And all of these are costs that add up over the life cycle of the car. Here is an example, actually it's a real example of a Mercedes Benz, not a car, but the vans. And this is an example uh, where Mercedes uh, Benz uh, has a big uh, contract with a company which is like FedEx and UPS, but not here, but in, the, in Europe, it's called DHL. And essentially DHL is the key customer of Mercedes-Benz vans. So this is how Mercedes salespeople go talk to the customers, especially the DHLs of the world, about the total cost of owning a Mercedes-Benz van. And essentially, if we try and take a look at it, so yes, the customer buys a van, but on top of that, what do they have to do? They have to pay the wage of the driver who drives it. They have to pay the social security. They have to pay the salary of the driver. They have to pay for other staff who have to maintain the machine. There are other fixed costs that you have to do like registration and stuff, tax, toll, insurances. So essentially what you have is all of these plus the fees associated with the car itself, right? For example, fuel, uh, add blue, I don't know what that is, but lubricants, maintenance and repair. And all of this together constitutes the total cost of ownership. So it's just like what I showed you here, except that there are more details out here. And what is interesting is if I'm a key account manager, you will see that the more dark colors are where a key account manager can help make a difference to the customer about where they can have savings. Because when you try and take a look at the, the wage of the driver, staff costs, these are costs that a key account manager, it's not ours, it's the cost that the customer has to face anyway. So you have to start asking yourself, how can I keep the costs that I can control for my customers, how can I keep it as low as possible thereby making it easy for the customers to do business with us, okay? And this kind of what are all the different steps involved in the typical key account selling process, right? Now, of course, since this is a class on 432, you pretty much know that, yeah, of course, there are tactical aspects of selling. That is, how do I go about the actual selling? But at a very high level, when I'm talking about key accounts, these are all the things that you need to do. So this concludes part two of key account management. So part one was about how do I choose my key accounts? Part two is once I do my key accounts, then how do I go about strategically selling to them, right? So once I do these two, then of course the next thing is that how do I develop a plan to help my customers? And that's what we will discuss in the next session, right? But for now, I'm going to stop sharing this and now I'm going to answer some of the questions that you had from your pack pack. Right. So let me go ahead and share this. Okay. How has the internet made the customer, uh, customer a problem worse? Essentially, uh, personally, what has happened is that because of the internet, your customers have become more knowledgeable. When the customers have become more knowledgeable because you now no longer need the sales rep, you can actually go do your homework online. The second thing is even without the, the salesperson of the competition coming in, the fact that the customer can go not look at your website, but also look at the website of the competition means that the customer has become more knowledgeable. They know more about the competition which means that they are going to try and negotiate the value. And they're going to do this by trying to lower the price because they will make claims that the benefits that you claim you're delivering, they'll say, well, we looked at the competition. And we think the, comp the, the kind of benefits you can provide with your, with your solution is the same as what I get with the competition. So which means that I don't see any uniqueness or any differentiation as to why I should pay that price. 
So to a large extent, that is why the internet has made the customers more knowledgeable, not necessarily a problem as such, but you have to learn to deal with it. Do customers today give customers value? Do salespeople today give customers value primarily through personalized offerings rather than product knowledge? Well, the answer is that if you go back all along, I've been saying the following. We said value is going to be benefits over price, right? But the benefits is got from understanding the needs of the customers plus the features of your offering, right? Needs are what the customer has. To fulfill those needs, what do I have to make it happen as well? So those features can further be broken down into products, services, and the brand. So when you talk about personalizing, let us say that I cannot do anything about the product but I can personalize the services. So this personalization is what is expected today from salespeople. If the customer just wants to buy the product, they do not need a salesperson to come and talk to them. They can just go interact with the bot or go online and buy. But when the customer has special needs, it is upon the salesperson to go identify those needs and link it to the extra services. And that's why there's much more personalization for those customers whose needs are not necessarily standard. Is winning early and often the best approach? The answer is absolutely yes. But in this day and age, what, how would you define win? Uh, from the companies that I am talking to a lot these days, especially because of the fact that the customers are becoming more and more knowledgeable, one of the uh, best ways to win early is not to actually get the sale, but actually get into the head of the customer before the customer decides what they want to buy. Remember, we began this class by this classical number that says 57% of a buying decision is made before a customer talks to a B2B salesperson. So my point is, if you come in as a salesperson only after 57%, you have a problem. So if you want to win, you have to go early, even to the point where it is zero, where the customer is not even aware that they have a problem. Or some people say we have to go even earlier so that when the customer is thinking of a problem, they're already thinking of you as the supplier, at which point in time when that happens, you're more likely to win and win early. But the problem, of course, is how early do I want to go? Do I want to go at 0% where the customer does not know what's happening but is thinking about it? Or should I go even before that and educate the customers? But when you do that, you will be expecting your salespeople to do this and it makes it very, very expensive because essentially your salespeople will have to go and kind of educate your customers to the point where they actually come and buy and that might be a lot of time uh, between that and essentially salespeople might say, yeah, the cost of sale might go up. And so they might not be willing to go do all that hard work well as well. How do companies find the balance between training their sales reps and cutting costs relating to salespeople? I think this is a very, very uh, interesting point. Uh, the key aspect here is that um, companies, uh, most of the time what happens is that a lot of companies train their salespeople when they are new to the company. Because at the end of the day, you need to make sure that the salespeople are trained on the products and the services and the way you sell initially. So there's a lot of upfront training happening. And then the whole idea is that once they start and get their initial training, after that, we'll periodically come back and train them once a year or two times a year. Right? The idea in terms of training to a large extent is salespeople learn with the 70-20-10 rule. 70% they learn on the job. 20% they learn from their managers and peers. Only 10% is what they do in a typical class setting. And essentially what happens, of course, is that uh, I think um, if you try and take a look at what is happening is this 10% class setting 
because of COVID or any time there is something bad that happens in the economy, this is the first thing that gets cut as cost cutting. So essentially, I personally think an organization has to make sure that you have to know specifically what are the challenges facing your sales organization as they go out into the field and not focus on cost cutting, but focus on how can I efficiently bring the training to the, the salespeople. So essentially think about your own online class right now. What is happening in a lot of companies right now in the past, they would take all of their salespeople, put them in a typical classroom and give them training. What they realized very quickly from that is that that makes it very, very expensive because when you have to do that, you have to pay for the salespeople to come and physically come to the spot. If it's a two or a three day program, you have to pay for the hotels. On top of it, when they're doing all these kind of training programs, they're not visiting their customers. So companies are asking themselves, can we use technology to bring the content so that every salesperson can learn not sitting in a classroom, but on their own when they have the time, when they're in airports, or when, the, when they're driving and you can listen to podcasts. So you see that when you do that, not only are you making your training more effective because you're customizing it according to the learning pattern of the, of the, uh, of the salesperson, but you're also not necessarily going with the extensive training program where you bring them into a classroom and you have to pay for all that as well. So you see that companies are beginning to use technology but it is still unfortunate that when you have times uh, that get difficult, the first thing that gets cut are training budgets, unfortunately. Has persuasive sales completely gone by the wayside or do some companies still push the strategy in the sales force? I think when you read articles like the ones that you read, uh, do understand that the companies that write these articles have an agenda in mind. Uh, they have their own sales methodology so they say persuasive sales is, done, is gone, but I think it depends upon customer by customer and salesperson by salesperson. See, sales is a persuasion business. That's always, you always have to persuade somebody to part with their hard earned money to buy your particular product or your solution or your service. So we are always in the persuasive business. Now, of course, the way you go about dealing with it, with what methodology that you use is quite different. So I personally think, that persuasive sales has not died, even though the article might say. But in my opinion, if we understand and say that it is a job of every salesperson to persuade those they come across to be able to change the way they buy, then you're already winning. So essentially, that's what you should be looking at. What is the best way for traditional salespeople to adjust from the compensation training and automation focus to a more fundamental based focus. This is something that uh, is not within the salesperson, it's actually the sales organization by means of how it sets the targets and the incentives for the salespeople. Actually, what you need to understand is that if I do not set the right kind of targets, that is what are the salespeople supposed to be achieving? What is their quota? Or if I don't tell them how much money they can make if they hit a quota, then essentially what you're doing is that you're not making them learning. You're making them focus on how do I hit the quota without necessarily telling them how to hit that quota. So what you want to do is that if you do, if you provide the right kind of quotas, you have the right kind of compensation, but you fail to get your salespeople trained on the fundamental basics of sales, they are going to fail in making the sale when, they, when that happens, then they are not going to make their compensation and that becomes an issue. Yeah. Uh, what are some ways a company can convince customers to go from transactional selling to consultative? Well, the first and foremost is that one of the things which I did not mention in this class, of course, is that to a large extent, what you have is that a transactional customer is not always a customer who does not want to buy from you. It could be that you could have a transactional customer who might say, I am just going to test this particular supplier to see if they do a good job, right? Now, compare that to another transactional customer who says 90% of what I'm buying is from the competition. So which means that your chances of converting a transactional sale, so both of them are transactional sales, right? One is a transactional sale where a customer wants to test the waters with you. 
but they don't want to give you a big order because they want to make sure that you're able to deliver on it. But you could also have a transaction customer who is loyal to the competition and only comes to you under certain circumstances. So the kind of customers where you go, where they predominantly do business with the competition, it is much harder to con convince them to move up from transactional to consultative. On the other hand, if there is a customer who is testing you out to see whether you can deliver on your promises, then your ability to deliver on those promises become extremely critical to be able to convince the customer that I, I am going to deepen my relationship with that particular customer. So that's how you need to try and work on this. How can you effectively segment if you're not supposed to segment by size? Well, that's what I always said is the best way to segment is gonna be based on the needs of the customer. So if you go in, if you go in and we talked about this question on what are the different ways to segment your customers, we said the first way of segmentation is a profile of the customer. And then we said, what is the behavior of the customer? And what are the needs of the customer? Right, if you take a look at all this, right, this is the easiest one. So market segment size is typically a profile. But just because a market segment has a size does not mean that that customer is going to come and buy from you. If you do not fulfill the needs of the customers, then it's very, very hard. So any kind of segmentation that involves how has the customer behaved in the past or what are their needs are much better ways of segmenting rather than just saying size because size tells you nothing. There could be a big size, but maybe you don't have the necessary product to be able to get out there and get convince the customers to buy your product. Or the market might be pretty big, but your competition is so strong that your customers are used to buying from the competition, then it's also gonna be very hard. So you have to be very careful how you segment your market and an ideal segmentation is using, using a combination of all these three. So we've already talked about how to do this. Uh, what are some ways for a company to progress the relationship with its customers from transaction to consultative? We already talked about this. What is the best, most efficient way to detect what exactly a customer needs? This is, uh, uh, this is really, really interesting that you talk about this, but it comes from in the past from people, my generation. This typically comes from what we refer to as a kind of voice of customer. What is a voice of customer? As a salesperson, you will go visit the customer and interview all the people in the customer's organization, not all, but most of the key decision-making unit members and record that and then go back to your organization and try to see what you can do. That was in the past. Right now, you can also do this, plus you can do what, what, what do you say is social listening. So essentially you can track, you can keep track of what your customers are saying on social media. So not only will you do the traditional voice of customer, but you look at social listening. Uh, you will also look at more inbound marketing. So essentially you could have websites which has a lot of important information and then the customer automatically visits your website and asks questions to you. You could also look at new tools like what is called account-based marketing. Account-based marketing is mail marketing. So you can actually email potential customers and say, here is a new solution that you have. If you're interested, would you like to talk to us? So this is how technology is impacting it, but that old traditional way is looking at voice of customer. So that brings me to answering all the questions here. So again, uh, for the next class, we'll pick up on uh, key account management again. We'll talk a little more about what is a key account plan. And essentially, once that is the case, and then I will discuss the pack pack questions, and then we'll move on to e-commerce and inside sales after that. Well, thank you very much.